Hey, one more time for the choir and uh, all that you did this morning to just celebrate the Lord. Thank you for that. And uh, I want to uh, also just a quick word of appreciation. There's a, a, a team of ministers called uh, Audio Video. They run every light, board, camera, mic, you name it. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't happen without these guys. And uh, the 99.9% .9 of the time that nothing goes wrong, we don't even know they're there. But when it doesn't, we all wonder, where are they doing? <laughs> well, they're doing what the best they can with what they got, and they very rarely get uh, a sincere word of appreciation. And I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you. You give up time on these cameras. You touch the world. Uh, folks that, um, that couldn't be here, can't be here, don't live here. Uh, I was in a discussion with um, some folks that help us with our media uh, on the Jeff LeBorg side uh, of ministries, and they shared with me just a, a matter of weeks ago, conservatively, uh, and I know that uh, there'll be, you know, there's, we're, we're inclined to say, you know, hundreds of thousands. Uh, we don't know that, but we do know conservatively and legitimately that somewhere um, around 18,000 people a week uh, in some form or fashion are watching this service. We know that from hard data. That blows my mind that from a, a location in East Tennessee, we could touch 18,000 different lives with the gospel of Jesus. So I want to say to the online campus, we welcome you and we bless the Lord for you. Get your Bibles. We're going to the book of James. We're in a series out of what is called the New Testament uh, book of Proverbs uh, written by James. So you're going to go to James chapter 1. And as you make your way to James chapter 1, uh, let me uh, just set the tenor and the tone before we get to the text of, of chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. James is the half-brother to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, that um, is a shock to some, but if you study the Gospels, you'll discover that not only do we have the book of James that was written by the half-brother of Jesus, uh, there's also another book that was written by a half-brother to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. His name is Jude. Um, now, we know from the Gospels that Jesus had at least four brothers and three sisters. We know that from the Scriptures. We also know that uh, according to the lineup in Scripture that James is the eldest behind Jesus. So Mary, um, who is a virgin, that is, a, that is an absolute unwavering biblical doctrine of truth, uh, she had at least seven other children after her and Joseph married. So when we say half brother, half sister, that means they had the same mom, but the different, but a different. Yeah, there you go, there you go. Some of you are going to get that in a minute. So, um, so what we're doing is we're just unpacking this book for its practical and powerful principles. I want you to look, if you would, at verse two of uh, the book of James, and we're going to read uh, and uh, uh, through about verse five. Are you ready? All right, it is our custom to rise out of reverence for the reading of God's Word. If you can, that's awesome. If you can't, no condemnation. Uh, fix your attention on verse 1, James chapter 1. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Father, may you bless the reading of your word, the hearing of your people. Liberate the movement of your spirit in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. And you may be seated ever so quickly. James is um, pastoring a, a, a church in Jerusalem. I don't have time to go through all the, through the matrix of history. You just have to simply understand this is a man who grew up at least early in, in the years with Jesus. Um, he didn't come to saving faith until after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He is now um, known for his life that is so passionate for Christ. The church has, according to conservative estimates at this point, the church that he's pastoring in Jerusalem, which is almost predominantly Jewish, now, that's important that you understand that. Um, it, he's pastoring a church that they say conservatively is about thirty to 35,000 people. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine? It reminds me one day Lucy walked up to Charlie Brown and said, Charlie, you look down. You look like you're in the doldrums. And Charlie said, well, I, I just got to tell you, I'm, 
I'm worried about this old world. And Lucy said, well, Charlie, what you got to do is love the world. He said, Lucy, I love the world. It's the people in it I can't stand. <laughs> well, I hope we don't feel like that this morning. But, oh, Pastor James, now, to be candid, he's, he's pastoring uh, much like uh, the time we're living in. In fact, sometimes we divorce the Scripture from its supernatural capacity. Sometimes because we are inclined to believe that this antiquated document called the Bible is, has no relationship, has no relevance to where we're at right now. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, I submit to you that not only is it relevant, but it, one of the evidences that it is supernatural is its capacity to be, to be lifted up off that page and set down. You're, you're talking about a 2,000 year span of time between the writing of James and the reading of the book of James this morning. How in the world could a book, I mean, no cars, no internet, um, no, 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 no um, uh, uh, pandemic. The, the, you're totally, completely separated by culture and tradition and understanding. If you went back 2,000 years and tried to explain how we're living and what we're living in, they would have looked at you like you had three heads. There's no way to relate that. But the Word of God always transcends and brings a truth like nothing else can. So I want to give you my outline because I want you to get a hold of it because we're going to move quickly through it. I want to give it all to you so that you can just kind of flow with the outline of truth that I believe is coming out of this text. I want to talk to you this morning about uh, three very profound truths that just flow. Number, number one, membership has its privileges. Membership has its privileges. Uh, secondly, life has its problems. Say amen. And thirdly, God always has a plan. So let's, let's look first at membership has its privileges. Uh, would you look there at verse 2 and notice how that James uh, starts out his introduction. After he says greetings to them, he, he personalizes. He says in verse 2, he says, my brethren. Now, we tend to want to pass through that because we, we believe that's merely a courteous greeting, some, some stolid salutation of, or introduction but, but it's not. And it's not even a biological affinity. He's not saying, my brethren who are born of Jewishness. It, it's it, it's, a, it's, it's an, a term of affection and identification. In fact, do you know, beloved, that if you took the five chapters of the book of James and you marked every time he said, my brethren. Now, now that's not just a male, okay? So let me give you a word that doesn't exist, but we're going to use it for the sermon. Say amen. amen. My brethren and my sistren. Okay, so we just understand that it's covering everything. And what he's talking about is not biology, he's talking about the blood of the lamb. Do you know that in five chapters he uses that word brethren 15 times? Why? I I'm going to tell you why. Because membership has its privileges. You and I, I I'll be candid with you, I don't, I don't possess the intellect or the vocabulary. I, I wish I could enunciate. I wish that I could somehow uh, pull out of the language and show you the power of what he's saying when he's talking about membership has its privileges. We've turned the American church into a, into a consumer-centric, um, activity-based religious club. Now, I'm not talking about the church you're sitting in. I'm talking about in general. We, we, in general, took the church, and we got more interested in growing it wide than we did deep. We, we, started, we started focusing, success is now buildings and budgets and personalities and programs and how many seats are in a pew and how many nickels and are, are in the plate. That, that, that's not at all the New Testament criterion for success. That's, now, that doesn't mean we don't need a building. Somebody thank God we're not sitting in the cold this morning. Amen? Amen. Don't like the weather here? You're new here? Hold on. You'll get a sunburn tomorrow. It'll be 11,000 degrees. Don't worry. It's East Tennessee. It changes every day. Aunt Dot turned 91 Tuesday. And uh, I said to her, it's cold here. She said, yes, this is red bud winter, and, and uh, it's going to get warm, and you're going to have black, uh, you're going to have dogwood winter. So, and she said the biggest snow she remembers as a child was in May one year, and they had a foot and a half of snow in May because the dogwoods bloomed late, and dogwood winter couldn't. I said, Aunt Dot, ain't none of that true. She said, you're too young to know and too stupid, and I am old, <laughs> and I'm telling you. So if it snows in May, we're all going to see Aunt Dot. Amen. I don't know what my point was other than this. My point is he, he, he's, he's drawing us in to this affinity, to this affection. The, the American church 
is, is, a, is an elective for the average believer. I can take it, I can leave it. I can go, I can not. I'll build my schedule around everything else. Now, I'm not fussing. I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying. Please, I'm not fussing. I, I, I'm, I promise. What I'm trying to do is help you understand where he's going when he says membership has its privileges. What he's talking about is what he's about to address. As, as a believer, there is a supernatural dynamic and what he's about to talk about, which is this, life has its problems. If someone told you, if you'll get up this morning, walk down this aisle, pray this prayer, get in this water, and become a good, solid, Bible-toting believer, you'll never have another problem. Let me stop you right there to say this. You've never had problems until you step up, whisper the name of Jesus. They don't mind you using the generic name of God. They don't mind you following Buddha. They don't mind you being ecumenical. They don't mind you talking to the higher power of the universe. But the moment you speak the name of Jesus and you bend that knee, bow that head, and submit that heart to the one who is king of kings, every demon in hell that never bothered you is going to put your picture up in hell's post office. And, and here's the, here, that's the bad news. That's the bad news. You go, you're going to be on the opposite side of this world. But here's the good news. You've got a captain of your salvation. You've got a general who's already won the battle. You'll never go to the fiery furnace that the fourth man's not there. You'll never end up in the lion's den that the, the lion of the tribe of Judah hasn't already tamed them. I promise you on the authority of God in this life, you will have tribulation. But when you're part of the family of God, you've got something inside the faith family that people don't even begin to appreciate. Now, let me, let me just tell you how I know this. There, there's, I'm going to illustrate this two ways. He says, my brethren. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to Jews who are now following Christ. So their Jewish people don't want anything to do with them. But because they're Jews following Christ, now there's been Gentiles saved. And the Gentiles don't like the Jews. And the Jews are suspicious, uh, suspicious of the Gentiles. And then they found out that they're no longer a Jew and they're no longer a Gentile. They're a new creation in Christ. And they're trying to figure out who they are. And nobody trusts anybody because the Gentiles showed up at the potluck with fat back and beans. Y'all read your Bible, it just helped my preaching. I'm just telling you right now. And they're looking at each other sideways out of the head going, now wait a minute, wait a minute. you can't bring ribs to the Jewish church. And somebody said, well, I heard in the prayer line, I heard in the prayer line that, that Peter was having fat back. What's the, what's the privilege of membership? Let me give you two things very quickly and we'll, we'll move to the, to the next point. Number one, what happens when you become part of the body of Christ? I'm not talking about the, the, the organization of, of, the, of, of the ecclesia. I'm not talking about the, the, the building and the budget and the Bible. I'm, I'm talking about the supernatural being lifted out of death and brought into life with Jesus. What, what's, what's the benefit of membership? Um, uh, let me see if I can explain this this way. When Christy and I first started going to Israel um, back now 23 years ago, uh, my first trip, I was on a bus. Our guide, uh, who knew the Bible inside and out, and as a pastor, it was quite embarrassing to me. But he grew up in the land of the Bible, so it, it was just in, it was it was it came out of him. It was just like a remedial thing. He just knew it. And I said to him one day, we, uh, his name was Theo. I said to Theo, Theo, when did you when did you come to saving knowledge of Jesus? When when did you? That moment when the Spirit of God opened your eyes and gripped your heart and you whispered the name of Jesus. He said, uh, well, never. I said, uh, hey, Theo, um, I don't think he understood what I said. When were you born again? And Theo said to me, oh, I was born a Christian. Now, we had a Muslim driver. That sounds like a bad joke, doesn't it? That sounds like a bad joke. A Muslim, a Baptist preacher, and a confused dude walking a bar. I mean, come on, y'all. That is, that is the makings of a great joke. I'm sitting on the bus. The Muslim driver looks at, at my wife and says, I don't know what that preacher's doing, but he's not going to get anywhere with Theo. Theo is an Orthodox. He's raised Orthodox Catholic, actually, over there. And you're, you're born a Christian. Let, 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 time out, time out. Not Baptist, not Methodist, not Catholic, not Muslim, not Jewish. If you are not born again, you do not go to heaven based on your baptistry. You don't go to heaven based on your pedigree. You don't go to heaven based on your work. If you are not born again, I promise you that the label you wear today will burn up off as you go up into glory because there are no labels that get you in the door. It's the blood of the lamb that gets you in the door. 
So Theo said to me, but I, I've always been a Christian. I was christened and, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I, my, whole family's, my whole family's Christian. We were all born Christian. No, no, and double no. That's not how that works. So the privilege of membership is not merely joining the church. It's coming into the body of Christ. Let me give you two benefits of that very quickly. Number one, there's a supplement that's brought to my life supernaturally I wouldn't have if I didn't have a church family. I have said this a thousand times. I'll say it, I guess, a thousand till I die or Jesus comes and gets me. I do not know how unbelievers make it through this world without a faith family. I don't. I, I, you don't have to come to church to be saved. I understand there's no hurt like church hurt. I understand all of that. But listen to me. If you do not have a rock solid, praying, loving, faith family that can supplement where you are, today, in just a few moments, we're going to lay hands and we're going to commission. We're going to pray over my son, his daughter, and, and uh, our granddaughter. They're getting on a plane to go ac uh, around the world to a country where it's illegal to share the gospel. And he could be in, in, in prison for doing what he's going to do. Get, listen to me very carefully. It will be this church family that helps carry us through that. I had rather him be in the will of God with his wife and child in a country where it's illegal than to stay out of the will of God in a country that, that, that is relatively safe. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So there's a supplement. There's, there, there's times when men of God, when those who walk in places that Jeff Laborg hadn't been yet can supplement, can come along and say, hey, preacher, have you thought about him? Have, have you walked in this truth? There's a, it, there's, there's a supplement to having a faith family. But I'm going to tell you something else. There, not only is there a supernatural supplement to having a faith family, but some of your faith family is heavenly sandpaper. Let me try this on this side over here. Some, some of them are heavenly sandpaper. And when, when you, listen, when you see them coming, you can hear it. <laughs> and you bristle. You think, oh, Lord, get the Neosporin out because here they come, son. They can rub me seven ways from Sunday the wrong way. And do you know what I've discovered? I have discovered that there are times when God will intentionally put heavenly sunpaper, uh, sandpaper in, in my life to rub the Jeff off of me so he can put the Jesus on me. And I've had people walk off and I thought, you know what? I'm going to move your letter. You're an Episcopalian. You don't even know it, son. Well, I'm gonna, I, you ain't even. And the Holy Ghost will say, I put them here for that moment, for this time, because they needed to speak a truth into your life. There are privileges in membership. Now, why is that important? Because if there's privileges in membership, being a part of the bride, why? Because life has its problems. Now, look very quickly, if you would, at verse 2. He said, my brethren, count it all joy. When you fall into various trials. Uh, now, I want you to notice, uh, if you would, if you write in your Bible, if you don't, don't worry about it. Uh, verse 2, would you underline the word when? Did you notice what it did not say? <laughs> it did not say if. It didn't say if. Because when you come to Christ, you're not getting a trouble-free life. It's not the absence of problems. It's the presence of the problem solver. There's the difference. And people will say, well, I, I, I want to get saved. But if I get saved, are all my problems going to go away? No. In fact, you're going to get a whole new host of problems, but here's the difference. You're going to have a mind that can be transformed through the renewing of Christ. You've got an infallible word that can give you direction. This book does not tell you, it does not tell you the name, the date, and the time of who you're going to marry. It doesn't. But it can tell you who to look for. It can, it can give you the qualities so that when it comes time for you to get married, you can lay that down and say, you know what? That, that person does not match up what this book says. Now, otherwise, you, you're going to be left to your own devices. And you're not going to be able to walk in wisdom. Why? Because if you don't have a faith family that can show you, can speak into your life and tell you, hey, listen, by the way, the honeymoon's going to be over one day. Yeah. And about six months after this person, you can't live without... <laughs> has left the top off the toothpaste for the 11th million time. <laughs> My wife, whom I love desperately, let me qualify this. Um, My wife does not understand how I operate in the kitchen. When I'm in the kitchen, I have to assemble stuff. You understand what I'm saying? I have a method to what I'm doing. I want to first go get the cereal. 
I have to check it because my kids come in and out of my house and they eat it all. So first I have to go get it where I hid it because now I hide it. So where I hide it is deep in the pantry, which I have to open a big door and I have to, I am blessed. I'm built small so I can get back in there. And once I find it and I take the chain and the duct tape off of it, <laughs> then I have a system where I have, I get the almond milk and I have a very specific bowl that I eat out of and I have a very specific spoon I want to eat with. And so when I'm getting all this laid out, I leave everything open. Drawers are open, cabinets are open, refrigerators open, because I am in process. You understand? I have to do this in process. If you mess with my process, I'm going to have a problem. So everything is on the counter. The cabinets are open, the drawers are out, the refrigerator's open, and I am in the middle of making a masterpiece called cereal. To which my wife walks in and says, that's what my wife says, you have problem with closure. That's what my wife said. My wife said that. She said to me the other day, you have a problem with closure. I said, you got, you, wait a minute. You mean to tell me you just psychologically diagnosed me with, with an issue with clo because I know how to operate in the kitchen. That's, that's what, I mean, let's just get down to it, okay? And she, this is what she says to me. It is obvious that we need to pray for God to heal you <laughs> with closure. I'm thinking to myself, there's some things I'd like to close right now. <laughs> now I know, shut down, don't judge me, you bunch of reprobates. I'm making a point here. Thank God there have been men of God in the privilege of membership that to walk alongside of me and say, you, you can't say that. You can think it. And here's the bad thing. After you've been together as long as we have, she can hear me think it. <laughs> so there's some men in this house that I'll pick the phone up and call and say, I'm on my way to the emergency room <laughs> because she heard me think it. <laughs> here's, here's my point. Listen to me. If, if you ever forsake the fortifying fellowship of, of, of believers... You are giving up a significant portion of the gift of God that he gave in salvation. You didn't just get saved to get out of hell. Do you understand he endowed you with a whole church family that's supernaturally empowered for the very... You, listen, you may not even be here. This, you may walk out of here this morning and say, that's absolutely the worst sermon I've ever heard in my life. I got absolutely nothing out of it other than this. You may not be here this morning to hear the sermon. It may be that when you got saved, you were given a gift to operate in. And this week, you got a word from the word to operate in your gift. And you walked across the parking lot to see somebody you haven't seen in a while to give them a word they needed that you didn't even know they needed. And now they're wondering how you knew they needed needed it and when you walk off they got something from you that could only come from the father and the whole reason you're in this house today is for no other reason than to strengthen another brother in the Lord Amen. and I submit to you that's that's enough reason to get up and come to church Amen. it's not all about us it's not all about me it's not all about my type of music or I like that sermon or I don't it could be that God did nothing else today than other than set you in this house to say to somebody going out the hallway, hey, I, don't, I know you don't know me, I don't know you, but can I just tell you, for some reason, every time I, every time I sing you today, this is the verse God's put on my heart, and it may be the very thing God told them a week ago to believe him for, yeah. and you may be the very one, be used to the Holy Ghost for God to say, I've been trying to tell you, Goober. I, and I made them get up, get out of their pajamas and put their pancakes down to come to church to tell you what I've been trying to tell you all week long. Yeah. Why? Because membership has its privileges. Why? Because life has its problems. How do you know that? He says, count it all joy when, when you encounter various trials. Now that word various is where we get our word variegated, multicolored. Do y'all remember, do y'all remember in, 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 I think it was science class. I wasn't paying that much attention. Don't penalize me. But I think it was science class. Do you remember when the science teacher brought that prism, that little crystal out, and they took that, that flashlight and they shined it through that prism and that yellow light hit that clear prism and on the other side of it, boom, a rainbow of colors. Y'all didn't have that here, did you? I can tell by looking at you. <laughs> Okay, let me, tr let me rephrase this. If you take a flashlight and you put it through a, a crystal, on the other side of it, it will explode in color. 
because it takes that yellow light, puts it through the, through the prism of that, of that uh, crystal, and it explodes in color. That's what this word means. It's a prism of problems. Do y'all remember? Do you remember? I'm going to try to do better this time because that last one didn't connect at all. Do y'all remember when you were in middle school and you woke up one morning and you had a zit on the end of your nose the size of House Mountain? Do y'all remember that? Come on now. Y'all help me out. Your mama came downstairs and you were, you, you were hunkered over a big old bowl of, of Captain Crunch crying. And she said, what's wrong? And you said, I can't go to school today. I, I look like Frankenstein. And she says, why do you care that you got a zit on the Well, because I'm in love with this hairy-legged hormone that's going down the halls of the high school. And if he sees Mount Everest on the end of my nose, I'm 14 and I'll be a widow. I'll be, a, I'll be an old maid the rest of my life. I'll never get married. That's the end of your life right there. It's a zit. Now, now, now listen to me. I need some folk to help me out here. Because I got some young people saying, yeah, that's true. That's real. That's real. House Mountain right here. This morning, I covered it up. It exploded, killed seven people. <laughs> now, stay with me. Hold on. How many in this room would go back to that moment? Because that is real to a middle schooler. Don't under That's real. How many of you would go back to that to trade a, a zit for stuff like malignant, yeah. chemo, yeah. radiation? Yeah. How, how many of you go back? How many understand... There's a prism of problems. And see, it isn't because God doesn't love you that we have problems. It's because we made a decision in this world to live apart from the will of God and Adam. And we decided to tell God, we, we, we know better than you do. And in that moment, he said, fine, you can have it. And this is what we get. And, it, and we don't have problems because God's not all powerful. We have problems because we told God we wanted to be God. And God said, well, I'm going to tell you, I got a remedy to this, so I'm going to have to send my son to come rescue you from your own ignorance in order. Now, even though I'm going to rescue you through redemption at the cross, you're still going to have problems in this world. Count it all joy when you encounter various trials. What in the world is he talking about? It's a prism of problems. And the, and the word count means to, it, it's an accounting term. The word count is an accounting term. Let me say it better that way. Meaning that you, you're running two ledgers. You're running deposits and withdrawals. So I've got to come to a place where I supernaturally live in a place that I can count it all joy that God's doing something supernatural in my life to the point that there are times when things will come into my life by the way of trial. And that trial will cause me to meet or open up to be vulnerable with somebody that's walked through it that I otherwise wouldn't have known. I have relationships in this church today because it, it, during the eight plus years I've been here, I've walked through some incredibly hard times. Those hard times that were meant by the enemy to destroy me actually created an opportunity for me to get to know somebody that carried a gift of wisdom or a gift of scriptural insight. And today they're some of the closest people in my life, but it had not been for the problem. I wouldn't have met the person. Yeah. And see, we're oftentimes we're, we're mad at God. God, how can you let this problem come into my life? And God's saying, wait a minute. The problem was coming anyway. It was coming anyway. I just decided I'm so sovereign. I'm going to let the problem introduce you to the person because I've done something in them that I want to do in you. You see the difference? Can I illustrate this very quickly for you? Say yes, because I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so if membership has its privileges and life has its problems, well, oftentimes because I don't count it all joy, what does that mean? What does all joy mean? It means that I take a perspective in a place where that I decide God is too good to be bad, he's too loving to ever hurt me, and anything that he's allowed to come into my life, it must be because he sovereignly knows I needed it, but I wouldn't have gone after it in my own flesh. Yeah. Boy, that's good right there, buddy. I don't know what I just said, but it blessed my spirit. I'm buying my own tape this week. Y'all understand what I'm... So here's what will happen. I get in the middle of something. I get in the middle of something, and God's got to show me. And the only way he can show me is, is to get the Jeff out of me. And sometimes the only way you can get the Jeff out of me is to create or to allow a problem that is so big that Jeff can't fix it. Yeah. Let, me, let me see if I can illustrate this for you. When, when I was pastoring my first church, I, I, I was out doing door-to-door -door soul winning. I was knocking on doors. And uh, uh, I got to this door, and it was really the first time this has ever happened in my own 
private life, in my own pastoral life. It was early on. I was not married. I was pastoring a church that was growing, but I didn't even know what to do with it. I'd just go out every day soul winning. I, I, the church didn't pay me much, and it was hungry days. Those were days when we, uh, it was tough to get by. And, but I discovered if you visit from 5 in the afternoon to 8 in the evening, guess what people are making? You're the preacher boys. Y'all look up here. I'm going to fix to teach you something. If you visit from 5 to 8 in the afternoon in the South, they're making supper. And good Southerners, even if they don't mean it, this is what they're going to say. We're just sitting down for supper. Would you like to join us? Now, you're supposed to say, no, I'll come back. Yeah, I'm in. I'd love to. Hallelujah. I'm a broke Baptist preacher, and all I got is some, some beanie weenies, and I got some of them Vienna sausages, but that stuff on top is making me gag. So I'd love to come in. I'd love to come in. I had a family member right after I began to pastor, I had a family member stuck his finger in my face and he said, I'm going to tell you what, you'll be back. You'll starve to death. He said, you'll starve to death. You'll beg me for money to buy food. In my first year pastoring, I, I kid you not, I gained almost 50 pounds. <laughs> it didn't cost I bought food, it's because I'm knocking on them doors. <laughs> And I'm having, I'm having the main course at your house. We're having apple pie at your house. And by 8 o'clock at night, I'm having coffee on the porch with somebody. So I'm knocking on these doors. I knock on this door. And this very beautiful young lady with, with three children, stair step. The oldest was three. Uh, she comes to the door. And, and I could tell I'd already interrupted something. And so I, the Holy Spirit told me when I knocked on that door, the Holy Ghost said to me, she's she going to get saved today. I thought, what was that? I didn't, I didn't know how to process it. So I... I, I make my way in the home, make it, make it short. I, I make my way into their apartment, and I, I mean, the Holy Spirit of God fell. I mean, it just fails. And she said to me, did you know I was going to get saved today? I said, you know, funny, you should ask. You know, when I was standing at your door, the Holy Spirit <laughs> told me you're going to get saved. Well, she started crying. I said, well, you don't have to be sad. She said, well, you don't understand. She said, the man that I love, my boyfriend, he lives here. We're not married. And she said, I know that now I'm a Christian. He can't stay. And I said, yeah, you're right. He can't. So fast forward. We talk a few minutes. I'm a young pastor. I don't have the answers. I, I know what I do today, but I, I, didn't, I didn't know what to do then. I just knew what the truth was, and I didn't know how to facilitate it. Well, I want you to know, guess who come to see me the next day at the church office? Her boyfriend. And he is mad. He, now, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but he's from up north. They have a tendency to speak their mind. <laughs> you know, down south, we say things like, bless your heart. That means I'm going to cut your head off. <laughs> you know, we, we flower it up. We're, we tend to be kind. Well, don't, don't we just love him? I hope he gets run over by a bus. Now, Yankees, Yankees, they just say it. They just tell you like it is. But he rolled up in my office. He said, I'm going to tell him to ask you something. What did you tell my girlfriend? I said, well, I told her about Jesus. He said, well, I know that's all I've heard. In fact, I slept on the couch last night, and now she's telling me i got to get out. And I said, well, I can't help that. That's, that's, that's Jesus. She belongs to Jesus now, and she's a daughter of the king. And if you're going to be with the daughter of a king, you got to treat her like the daughter of a king. And if you love her, you got to marry her. But the problem is you're not saved. She is saved. And he said, I know I slept on the couch. Guess who showed up that next Sunday? Her, the three kids, and the angry Yankee. <laughs> now, he's a, he's a vacuum cleaner salesman. He sells Kirby's door to door. That's what he does for a living. And I might add, he did it quite, quite well. So Sunday, they're, they're, they're in the service. She's glowing. And you could tell, but she's been set free. He's been on the couch all week. He's mad. <laughs> mad. He sits there with his arms crossed the whole service. Before we even get into the invitation, which I love because he didn't know the decorum. You have to wait till we rise and begin the invitation before thou cometh forth in order to be dealt with by the Holy Ghost of God. He didn't even wait, but he jumped up. We weren't even in the invitation. Boom, he come down now. He said, hey, hey, I'm going to ask you something. He said, so I'm being told by her, I got to get out. I said, well, you, you got to get out. The problem was she was drawing a check on those children and, and she was going to go destitute. I mean, this is real stuff. This is real life. He said, well, let me, let me, I've been, I've been checking you out. He said, you're single. You, you don't have a wife. He said, in fact, you live in a house by yourself. He said, I'm moving in with you. That's what he said to me. He didn't ask. He said, I'm moving in with you. He said, this Jesus stuff is real. He said, number one, I want to know. He said, I'm coming to live with you to find out if it is real. And he said, I'm coming to your house. Till you got me put on the couch. Now you got me put out of the house. He said, so if this Jesus stuff is real, I'm moving in with you. And I said to the Lord. 
Lord, I don't want a Yankee vacuum cleaner in my house. <laughs> and, the, and the Lord said, but you're going to. <laughs> now, now listen, listen to me, listen to me. Ultimately, I led that young man to the Lord. I was in my, I, I'd carved out a little place in Aunt Dot's house where I was having my private praise and prayer time. And he slipped around the corner. He lived with me for months. <laughs> And do you know what I discovered? It wasn't so much about me winning him to Jesus. It was about Jesus beating a Jeff out of me. He slipped around that corner one morning. I was, I, I was in my time with the Lord, and he said, I'm going to ask you something. Will you introduce me to the Jesus that you introduced Kim to? And I'm, I, I performed their wedding, and today they're in the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, listen to me. Had I not had some men of God around me in that little Baptist church, as a faith family to speak to me, I'd be in jail right now for killing a Yankee salesman. <laughs> he liked to drove me. He would come home from selling vacuum cleaners and he would work on his inventory from midnight till three in the morning. He was cleaning them Kirby's, plugging them up. You ever heard of Kirby? It's, if, if, let me ask you this. You ever heard of 737 Boeing jet? That's what a Kirby sounds like. He plugged them up. Whoa! I'm laying in the bed and they're going, God, Save him or kill him for the love of all of it. <laughs> now, now, what's the point of that? Had I not had some men of God in my faith family to say to me, listen, you got, you got to let God play this out. It, I, I would have missed the fact life has problems, but problems create possibilities. All it is is God just simply saying, listen, I'm going to work out patience. What is patience? Patience just simply says this. It says, I so trust God. I so believe God can do this. I'm not going to focus on the problem. I'm going to focus on what God's bringing my way because if he allowed this problem to come into my life, there must be something that he's doing in order to use the problem to make me look more like Jesus. So, so I would just submit to you, beloved, the problem you're facing today, it it may not be from the enemy. That's why we said last week, you've got to learn to discern. Trials will push me into the Father. Temptation pulls me away from the Father. Trials deepens my faith and causes a joy to come out of my life. Now, that doesn't mean you walk in the room and go, Whoa, I got cancer. You've you got bigger problems than that because <laughs> cancer is serious, and that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is that God's always in control in the life of the believer. Always. Now, if, 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 if membership has its privileges, my brethren, and life has its problems, various trials, then uh, God's always got a plan. Always. Now, I'm going to leave this with you, and we'll unpack this in the weeks to come. But we're, we're going we're, we're gonna, to, I'm going I'm to just give you this. Go back to the Word of God, and I'm going to show you something. Um, and I'm going to submit this to you and leave this with you. I want you to look, if you would, at verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now, remember, I define patience as just waiting on the Lord, believing that my problem is not my problem. The problem is an opportunity for him to do something in my life. So it doesn't matter what I'm facing. The problem is now the potential for God to show me something that I don't know about him previously, right? Okay. So patience is me just learning to wait on the Lord. Verse 4, let patience have its perfect work. Now, that word perfect does not mean perfection, sinless. It means maturity, to be complete, to grow you up in the faith. In fact, if you wanted a theme for the book of James, this is the theme. This is why people don't like the book of James. It literally means grow up. It just means, look, look, big boy, get out of the diapers, put the passy down, come out of the spiritual nursery, and for the love of all that's holy, grow up. Say amen. amen. So once I come to the place that I can wait on the Lord and trust that the problem's not my problem, what's, what God's doing with the problem is showing me the potential to learn something about him I didn't know so that I might be mature, perfect, complete. Now, I'm, I'm going to do something here that you're gonna, you, I need you to, by faith, take this a little bit. We tend to look at our problems on a, on a, uh, on a, a very horizontal plane. Like we get sideways with somebody in the church family. I ain't going back to that church. I don't even like them. What service they go to? She, oh, they go to the nine. I'm going to the 11. We don't have 11. Exactly. I ain't never coming back. <laughs> hey, come here. Come here. Shh. Come here. I'll ask something. You're going to heaven with them. What are you going to do? Step inside the gate and go, oh, my. I didn't know you were going to be here. I, 
taxi, <laughs> Uber. <laughs> well, there ain't but one other place to go, Goober. <laughs> you better learn to live with them here because you're going to be with them forever up there. Right. Amen? Well, that's different. You know, she won't be so hateful. <laughs> or maybe you won't. Or maybe you'll find out when you get there that the wound that she was operating out of or the anger that he operated in was such a deep-seated wound and he had a, he had a, he had a spirit of an orphan on him. And because you wouldn't be a spiritual father, he stayed mad because what he saw in you he could never see in him because he was told he wasn't worth anything. And you had a gift to bring up and encourage. And instead of being a Barnabas, you were a barnacle. And y'all got sideways because not because he had a wound from his dad, but because you wouldn't hear from your heavenly father to mention minister because you thought this church existed for your comfort instead of God's glory. I'm buying my tape for sure this week. (laughs) Let patience have its perfect work. What does that mean? I'm going to give you the long game. You and I, I almost told the guys upstairs to cue this. Do y'all know what the twilight zone is? Uh, Everybody of any age got some, y'all don't. But there used to be this show called The Twilight Zone. When it came on, this little spinny thing, and you knew you were about to go to the Twilight Zone. I almost had them cue it up this morning just before I said this. Just before I said this. Because I'm, I'm about to get a little tin foil hat. <laughs> so let me, let me say it the way somebody said it to me the other day. Laborde, your, your, your pronouns are conspiracy theorists. <laughs> your pronouns <laughs> You and I are living in a time just like James. It's a transition. Everything's being being upended. The Jews knew a currency that operated out of the temple authority, but now they can't operate in that currency because their, their Jewish people won't accept them as Jews because now they're Christians. Gentiles are precluded. They're, they're Levitically not allowed to be with the Jews. Therefore, they got a whole different economy. And everybody's living under the tyranny of Rome, which is a pagan, a, a pagan wicked, demonic, Bad stuff. (laughs) So there's a transition. Everything's upside down. You and I are living in a transition, and we don't like to talk about it. People get upset with me for bringing it up. But my job's not to make you happy. It's to make you aware biblically of what's happening. You've been told about three of the largest banks in in the world collapsing, which they are currently doing. What you're not being told is that's not three that are collapsing. It's actually 211 as of this morning. 211 have been taken over by the Fed or by some by some means globally because it's coming down. A lady that watches and loves this church desperately that lives multiple states away had the hubris uh, by led of the Holy Spirit of God to call me on Friday to say, Pastor Jeff, I love your church. We love Fairview. We watch it all the time. She oversees hundreds of millions of dollars in, 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 in uh, different uh, investment accounts. She's one of the top in her game. This is what she said. She didn't have to say this to us. She said, I so love that church and know that church has money put aside to develop Tazewell Pike property. I just simply want you to know y'all need to be careful because it is coming so fast and so swift. In fact, it's coming so fast and so swiftly that it may actually unfold before the end of the month because here's the plan. This is a woman who's done this. She's a third generation top investment banker in the world said to me, we're moving us to a digital currency. It's already being done. And there is quickly coming a time when you're not going to deal in cash. You're going to deal in digital currency. Now, what does that matter? Listen, if that causes you fear or trepidation, you don't know the one that we're talking about in this house. It doesn't cause me. Now, do I work? Am I hurting for my country? Do I, do, do I grieve for the law? lost because of the great deception that's coming? Absolutely I do. Is it it surreal that we're living in the last of the last days? We are that generation. On May the 14th 1948 that fig tree started blooming and I'm telling you on the authority of God's word 75 years this May the fullness of a generation we are the ones promised by the word of God that that generation which sees Israel return will be the generation to see the great coming of the king. So when you watch all of this unfolding, what in the world? Chemicals being spilled, uh, factories burning down, refineries unexplicably just blowing up. Uh, Now we're in the midst of a major financial meltdown. 211 that have been taken over and completely insolvent in just the last six days. What in the world is going on? 
I'll tell you what's going on. We're getting shook to the core of who we are. And the houses we live in and the money we've got and the cars we drive and the land we live in, we are about to find out that the most important thing is not what we possess, but who we're going to heaven with. The most important thing is not this building, but this body called Fairview. The most important thing is not the goods we got at home. It's the gospel that lives inside of us. And what James is trying to say to these people who've lost their identity and their family and their security, and they've lost everything around them, what he's trying to say to them is God's still in control. God's still in control. Aren't you worried, preacher? I mean, they digitize the income and they bring it down to four banks is what we're being told. And every other bank is going to be consolidated into some. Yeah, well, listen, read the book. It says very clearly, don't take the mark. You can't go to the market. Don't get the seal. You don't get the deal. Why are we surprised that we are living in these? I know it's surreal and we shake our head and say, oh, that Bible thumping Laborg. I'm telling you, he doesn't know. He doesn't, listen, I don't know, but I know the book. I know the book. And what James is trying to say to his people is this. It's changing. And it's coming fast. But the one that saved you will not change. The one who came and rescued you will never forsake you. And if you'll let God do in you what he started in salvation, what's he talking about when he says, let patience have its perfect work? What's he talking about? To bring you into a place of maturity. To operate in your gifts. See, we focus so much on you getting saved to get out of hell. We fail sometimes to remind you you're going to heaven. And can I just tell you, you're not going to sit on a cloud plucking a harp. <laughs> amen. Y'all say amen. amen. Now, you are going to have to make up for some sermon time. <laughs> a lot of you are going to be in class after class because you slept through some of my preaching. And I've asked the Lord, bring them in for 10,000 years and let me have them. <laughs> Do you know you're going to heaven? Yes. Now, now watch this. I'm done right here. Don't miss this. What the Holy Spirit is doing in you right now through this faith family, because you can't be all you're going to be without people around you. You are not made to do this alone. On purpose, he said, do not forsake the assembling together of yourselves. I can't be everything God called me to be without you. Why? Because life has problems. Well, what do I do when I get in a problem? He said, ask, 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 ask for wisdom. Okay, well, Lord, how do I get through this? And the Lord said, well, I tell you what, I got an old boy sitting in that church right there, and, and, and you don't even know this, but he's walked through this seven times hotter than you've ever experienced it. And he, I taught him something in the middle of his problem. He's going to teach you something in the middle of your problem, and you two are going to become a three-bound cord that's not easily broken. And what you're trying to get out of or around, I'm trying to get in you. And if you just listen to me, I will bring you to a place of maturity using those around you. Now, why is that important? Because soon and very soon, according to the scriptures, there's a great getting up morning coming. In an hour when you least think it, there is going to be a moment when God turns to his son who is seated at the right hand of the father right now, praying for you, calling you out by name. He has every hair on your head numbered or the lack thereof. <laughs> he, know, he knows everything there is about you, the good, the bad, the ugly. He, he knows it all. And right now, while you're in the midst of this service in worship and word, he's praying for you with insight from the Holy Spirit of God. It's in the word with groanings that cannot be uttered. While you're wrestling with the problem that you're thinking about, while you're wrestling with whatever you're facing, do you know that right now the Holy Spirit of God is saying to the Son who paid everything to withhold no good gift from you, is saying to the Father, Father, he belongs to me. She's mine. She's mine. I paid for her at Calvary. You can withhold no good gift. They need this. And the Father says, open up the bow, the, the the vaults of glory and pour it out. Amen. And then we say, Lord, we need an answer now. 2023, we need an answer. And the father said, well, I'm going to give you an answer, but it's not for now. It's not for now. In fact, I'm going to do something in you that is so profound through this problem that when I come to get you, you're going to leave that bag of bones, but we're taking what I'm developing in you with you so that when you get to heaven and you stand before the Bema seat and I reward you for doing in me what you couldn't have done without me, 
when I give you crowns for simply obeying the gift of the Spirit in you, then I'm going to give you a resurrection body. And according to Isaiah chapter 2, in the millennial kingdom, you're going to have authority over the, over the heavens and the earth in me. And according to Isaiah chapter 2, in your resurrection body, for 1,000 years there will be people living on the face of the earth in their natural bodies because Israel's going to get every inch of the land I ever promised. And while they're living in their natural bodies for 1,000 years because it's going to go back to like it was in Eden... When they didn't die early, if they live to be 100, they live as a youth is what Isaiah said. I'm gonna, you're going to live in a satellite city called the New Jerusalem. And every day you're going to come down in your resurrection body free from gravity. And you're going to minister. And they're going to say to you, how do you know that you can trust the Messiah? And you're going to be able to say, you know there was a March 2023. I was fighting hell by the half acre wondering what God was going to do to get me out of it. And he developed inside of me something that not only existed beyond on March of 23, but it exists into me today. Sit down a minute, pull up a stump by the river of life and let me tell you how good he's been. See what he's doing in you right now? It may not even be about right now. It may be that he's going to use it when you get to glory because Isaiah chapter 2, do you know what it says? It says, Brother Keith, it says that we will gather all nations to the hill of God. That's, that's Jerusalem. That's the mount of Jerusalem. That's the temple mount. We will gather all nations and we will teach them the things of righteousness as trophies of God's grace. Can you imagine standing there in a resurrected body looking at people who've been born in the millennial kingdom still grappling with whether or not to accept the Messiah? And we're able to say to them, let me share a testimony with you. Let me tell you what God did. And we call up the Fairview crew. <laughs> and they say, oh, we've heard about them. <laughs> and out of you comes flowing. Not what you got at the resurrection. What he developed in you here that brings him glory there.